Well, we've got the manger and we've got the cross. So we celebrate Christmas and uh, it is the beginning really of the, the story of Jesus. And we celebrate the cross, which is the culmination of his work, 33 years later, roughly. But his work isn't done, he's working even now in hearts and lives. And uh, through his spirit, as I preach these words this morning, he lands his word in our lives in the ways that we need. We need to hear from him this morning. I enjoy uh, moving through books systematically and, and verse by verse because every now and then this happens. I, I came to this sermon and the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, this is a Christmas sermon. I didn't even plan that. But the title I gave to this sermon is Big Things Come in Small Packages. Big things come in small packages. And when my mom was a child, oh, probably more 10, 10 to, uh, you know, 10 to through high school years, uh, her father, my grandfather, owned a jewelry store. And so uh, they knew that around Christmas time, it was likely that there would be a, a, a small package about this size, or maybe a couple of those, that would be hidden under the tree amongst the other gifts, which were larger and wrapped. And uh, it was always my mom's favorite thing to try to find the small packages, because she knew, typically, that uh, Grandpa had, had done something special and uh, was able to secure for her, I don't know, a new pair of earrings or something along those lines, and uh, in fact, many of those things she still has to this day. And so it's a good thing to remember, this is uh, actually inside of this, is the wedding ring that I handcrafted from a spiral wire notebook. Um, when I proposed to my wife, we keep it in this little box, usually it's not wrapped, but uh, then I went and took her and we picked out the ring that I knew she would want to select because my style at that point was a little more, um, well, iced out. Yeah, it was a little more gaudy, and she wanted something simple and elegant, and so I'm glad I did it that way, but we kept that original ring. It's, it's meaningful. It's uh, monetarily worthless, but to us, it's, it's very meaningful. So, big things in small packages. We're going to see that come out as we move through this text. Let me just begin uh, in chapter 13, verse 10. We left off a few weeks ago in, in verse 9. I titled this section, Compassion and Power, and Jesus continues his teaching ministry as he is moving toward Jerusalem. Verse 10, now as he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years, and she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. Now, we have to try to do our best to put ourselves in this situation. Uh, if you're part of this synagogue, you have uh, been there. We don't know how big of a, a town this was, but it's likely that in this scenario, it's not a huge synagogue, not any near the size of this church here this morning. The small synagogue, the people knew this woman. They had seen her struggle to get around. 18 years, she had been unable to stand up. And we find out in just a few verses that this was in fact a demon that had come and possessed her and bent her over and uh, was, was uh, what do you call that, afflicting her. She was afflicted by this demon. And that was the expression of this affliction is she couldn't stand up. Now picture, you, you think you have a sore back after a work day. Picture all of the, uh, the attachments and, and, and problems that she would be struggling with as she goes through. So here she comes into the synagogue and Jesus is preaching that day. It's the Sabbath day. She comes in. You have to ask the question, has she heard about Jesus? Does she know about this man? Well, who doesn't at this point? Jesus is immensely popular. There are hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people that are following him everywhere he goes. So it would have been pretty assumed to say that this woman knew 
that Jesus was in town and knew what he had been able to do for many others. And so she made her way to the synagogue and she comes in and there she is. And Jesus is teaching and he sees her. And first he calls out and he says, woman, you are freed from your disability. Now the question you have to ask here is at what point was she healed? And we don't know. But I'm speculating it was at that point. The word of Christ is powerful, and he heals her from her disability. He sets her free. But then she's still bent over. And, and just picture, if you haven't stood up straight for 18 years, you're probably not sure what to do. How does this work? Is it really, am I really set free? And so you can picture Jesus walking over and setting his hands on her. He lays his hands on her which Jesus often does. He touches her and raises her up. Now imagine her joy. Imagine what that would have been like. After all of those years, she immediately begins to glorify God. And those around, think of that. I mean, that happened in, in your view. It was a celebration, an incredible moment in the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus. A confirmation of his power, but it's also a display of his heart, right? This is the display of the master's heart. He is a, 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 a savior who is compassionate. He sees her, he speaks to her, he touches her, and she is set free. She is healed. Hmm. The problem is, <laughs> uh, there's some people in the synagogue who are seeing things a little differently. And so I titled this Confronting Cold-Hearted Legalism, verses 14 through 17. But the ruler of the synagogue, who was indignant because, was, was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, he said to the people, now don't miss this, he doesn't say this to Jesus, okay? This is passive, aggressive, defined he says it to the, the congregation. There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, but not on a Sabbath. You sinful, shameful people. How dare you come on the Sabbath to be healed? It's your fault that Jesus had to work. It's your fault. Wow. Wow. This man who speaks was in a position of authority. There would have been others as well, but he, he felt the need to speak up at this moment. And just imagine the moment. They're glorifying God. She's probably dancing around because Jesus never heals halfway. She is healed. She is able. There's no atrophy. There's, she is ready to go, bouncing around, jumping, celebrating, and he speaks to squash all of that joy. Blinded by his rules, his laws. Now, here's the thing to remember. The laws that Jesus was obeying and abiding by were the, 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 the ones given to Moses as it related to the Sabbath. He never felt himself bound by all of the hundreds of added, uh, uh, what's the word, Sabbath laws that they multiplied over the years. And this man is saying that what Jesus did is unacceptable, inappropriate, shouldn't be done. Mm. I'll just say this, I wouldn't want to be that guy. Dogging out the people in their joy as they celebrated the Lord and his grace. Jesus saw the Sabbath in a little different way than this man saw it. The legalist sees the Sabbath and he sees all the things you shouldn't do, all the rules. It's about keeping rules. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. So much so that the idea of rest was lost in rule keeping. Sabbath was one of the most meticulously work-filled days ever, not because of all the things you were doing, but because all the things you were trying to avoid doing. It was never intended to be that way. Jesus gets to the heart of it. What is the Sabbath really about? It's about rest. This woman for 18 years had toiled and she comes and Jesus gives her rest. 
He shows love to her. He functions in that moment in the law of love in a way that this legalist who rebuked the people had absolutely no inkling of. He didn't care about the woman's joy. He didn't care about the woman's plight or even possession. What he cared about was checking off the list, all of the rules, feeling good about himself, and judging the people who didn't do as good as he did. That's legalism, friends. Rule keeping to justify yourself before the Lord. It's toxic. No one has ever been saved by rule keeping. Let me say that again. No one has ever been saved from their sins by rule keeping. (laughs) And yet, the bulk of world religions today are built around this. Work, 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 do, do, do. Avoid, avoid, avoid. If you do it enough, if you do it good enough and perfectly, then you'll probably be okay. But you can never really know. It's on you. You have to do the work. Huh. Jesus had some words to speak. Then the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you, uh, where am I? Um, Does not each of you on Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were being done by him. Hmm. Jesus begins an argument from lesser to greater. He starts with with a donkey or an ox to the man who, who makes this accusation to all those legalists, those Pharisees who were sitting up there and, and judging, well, Jesus, really, but also anyone who was looking to him as a good teacher, as Messiah. They saw him as a lawbreaker. And he says, did you water your donkey this morning? Did you take him? Did you untie him? Okay. You loosed him from his bounds, from his, his chains, his, his tying up? Well, that's what I just did for this woman. Now, which is more important? You did this on the Sabbath, and I did this on the Sabbath. Any words to say to that? Answer, no. No. Hmm. They were put to shame. What did Jesus do? He unmasked their self-focused hard hearts. He just pulled back the veil on their self-centeredness and their self-righteousness. Jesus showed love. He gave this woman rest. And we know that the entire Sabbath itself is a pointer to Jesus, the one who gives rest. We enter into his rest as we trust him. Hmm. So I just would encourage us as a church to always have this in view. It is so easy as a church to begin to to kind of grow inward and think, you know what, this person just isn't conforming to the way things ought to be or or on this certain day it should be like this or this person just doesn't look like the rest of us and, and we have to make sure that they abide by the rules. Friends, the greatest law we could obey as we gather together is love. Love, love, love. To have compassion for those who are hurting, not condemnation. Now just say this, we can't overstate this. To, to, to call someone in love and then pull the truth away is not love. We, we never love someone by compromising or avoiding the truth. That, that's not love at all. But let's be clear. Don't add to the word of God and then hold people to it. When, when we come, let's come, come as you are, right? Come as you are. Come, wear what you, it blows my mind how many times people ask this when they're new to the church or they haven't even come yet and they're like, well, wait a second. What's the dress code? 
You have no idea how many people get stuck at that before they can come in the doors of the church. There is no dress code here, to be clear. What matters more to us is the condition of your heart, right? Where do you stand with Jesus? Come in, and we're gonna point you to Jesus. That's what matters most. Now, modesty matters, yes, that, ma- that matters. We don't wanna distract because of immodesty, and we wanna be careful not to be a distraction in the choices that we wear. So I try not to wear, you know, like a bright yellow shirt with a big smiley face on it, and it, all you can think is about the smiley face, and you miss the whole sermon, obviously. So we're being wise in what we wear, but don't get stuck, friends, in this legalism trap that so many churches cater to. The law of love, compassion, not condemnation. Now let's move on. Jesus confronts this this cold-hearted legalism, and then it leads him into something just immediately following, this is fascinating. Just trying to find the flow, the connection of this is, is a fascinating thing. In verse 18, he said, therefore, the therefore points us to what has just happened. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And, what, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made their nests in its branches. Now, the mustard seed, we've heard of this, haven't we? The the mustard seed. If we have faith the size of mustard seed, we can say to the mountain, be cast into the sea. Like there's, there's this imagery that Jesus has this reoccurring theme. It comes up again and again. But in this case, he's talking about the kingdom. In its beginnings, it, it, it begins this way. The kingdom is not ushered in in a way that we expect. In fact, when we were in Israel, we were just above, uh, well, just below, we were coming down from the city of Dan, which is up near the Lebanon border, and uh, Dr. John showed us a mustard seed plant, and Gracie collected a whole bunch of these. How many was it, Grace? A hundred and, a hundred and what? 180 mustard seeds, which you would think is, it takes up very little amount of space. In here, I have a handful of these, and you can only hear them. Can you hear that? They're tiny. I can barely see them, and I'm holding them up. They're really small seeds. Now, they're not the smallest of all seeds, but in Israel, people saw these seeds, and they knew this is a tiny little seed. Jesus said, it's like that. The kingdom of God, it's it's like a tiny little mustard seed. It's going to start small. It's not big and, and, and... interruptive, it's just a tiny little thing. Drop in the ground. What is the kingdom of God? It's the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. So I was thinking about the Christmas story. The small and subtle beginnings of the work of Christ on this earth. Think about the season that we're in and how the mustard seed shows itself. Look at this, a poor teenage girl right? You are chosen, you are favored. God has chosen to set his grace on you, Mary. She was a poor teenage girl from a no-name town. A scandal followed as the Holy Spirit came upon her and she was impregnated, right, to carry the Messiah himself before she was truly married to Joseph. What a scandal that was. She was from a small country town. Jesus was born in a shepherd's cave, in a town that was too little to be named among the clans. A baby in a manger, a manger wasn't like this. We, we sometimes think of a, a wood feed trough, but most likely in Jesus' day, it was in a shepherd's cave in a stone feed trough, chiseled out of stone, and he was set in the stone. It was dirty in there, unimpressive. Shepherds were invited to come, but no one else was there. It was just a a silent night overall. It was the most significant birth the world has ever known, and it happened quietly. Shepherds, the, the least likely to be invited, they were the guests that came that night. Carpenter from Galilee, Jesus was. What good has come 
from Galilee. Has anything ever significant come from Nazareth? No. A Roman cross. Isn't it amazing that the victory of our Savior happened in his death? Would you ever write the story that way? Well, maybe this side of the cross you would. The Jews had in their minds that the kingdom would be ushered in with might and military strength and conquering and a visible king on a visible throne and everyone bowing and a big deal. And Jesus is like, no, it's not like that. It's like a mustard seed dropped in the ground, but it's gonna grow. It's gonna grow and it's gonna get huge. The mustard plant is not the biggest. We, we have these huge trees, you know, the cypress and the cedars and the redwoods. The mustard plant would grow to say 10 feet tall, but the shrub itself can grow as big as this wall. And the birds love to nest in there. An empty grave with a few ladies that visit. Think about it. 12 chosen men to start the church. One of those betrays and is replaced. Three years, that's all. Three years of training. They didn't even have a four-year seminary degree. Just three years. Well, it was with Jesus. Mustard seed, friends. And here we are. Here we are. To this day, the church is growing God is working, he is moving, even still. I was struck by thinking about the little moments. The Christian life is a collection of ordinary moments, by and large. I mean, the, your expression of your walk with Christ happens maybe only a handful of times in the big moments. The rest of them are just normal days, ordinary moments. It's the little things where your faith shows itself, your, your response to an angry coworker, your compassion and, and, and love to stop and pray with someone who needs help on a Sunday morning, your, your good works for one another, the, the, the prayers that happen when no one's around, it's the little moments. It's the mustard seeds, primarily. That's the expression of our faith but they, they grow, don't they? In fact, I was thinking about this the other day as I was talking with someone. Every sermon is like a snowflake. Every teaching, every podcast, every time I open the word, it's like another snowflake. And the, the work of God, surprisingly, over the period of time is that it begins to snowball in my life. And, and I begin to see tremendous progress. I'm learning, I'm, I'm changing. He's changing me. Now, you can't, most of the time, you can't stop on a day or even a week and say, okay, I see that. But when you begin to look back, you begin to say, I I'm not the same person that I was. This, th th look at what he's done. It's the kingdom of God growing in my life, increasing in me, changing me, transforming me, growing us in the little moments. Again, he said, to what it, shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Now, the recipe here could feed over 100 people. We're talking about significant amount of bread. And all you have to do is just take a little bit of leaven and it permeates through all of that dough. You can't always see it. I mean, you've done this with with bread, you put it in there, and you just sit there and watch, and you could try to stare at it, and it seems like it does nothing, but you come back after an hour of sitting in the sun, look at what it does. Hmm. It made me think about the, the power of the gospel and the ends of the earth. Here's the reality, friends. We are not post-millennialists. We don't believe that God is going to establish a, a kingdom on this earth as we progressively get better and better and then usher in some utopian Elysium type of experience here. This, this is not going to happen. In fact, things are getting worse. The, the world will continue to get more godless and hard-hearted. The church will never dwindle out. That flame will burn bright, held by God's grace, even through persecution and opposition. But there will be a day 
where that leaven of the gospel reaches some from every nation, tribe, and tongue. That's what Jesus is saying. Here we are, we're, we're in this small little podunk synagogue in a no-name town, it's not even mentioned. Someday, there will be members of every nation, tribe, and tongue that bow to me as king. That's the mustard seed I am planting in my words. Hmm. And it won't come through legalism. It won't come through law. It'll come through Christ-like love. Hmm. Now he comes to the narrow door. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. He mentions this. Luke wants us to have this clear. This is his goal. He's heading toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Will those who are saved be few? Hmm. Listen to how Jesus doesn't answer the question. He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Jesus is not talking here about numbers. That is what God has chosen from before the foundations. In fact, all that the Father gives will come. Not one will be lost. Some from every nation, tribe, and tongue will come. And that is not wishful thinking. That is not a a hope. That is a a reality that has happened in the mind of God because he's chosen some from every nation, tribe, and tongue. They will come. But Jesus says, don't concern yourself about the numbers. Concern yourself that you yourself are striving to enter through the narrow door. Hmm. What is the narrow door? The narrow door is Jesus, friends. He's the narrow door. Jesus is not impressed with the thousands of people who follow him. He didn't come to win a popularity contest on earth. He he didn't come and, and celebrate the masses of people that were gathering and hanging on his words. What he was impressed by was those who trusted in him as Savior and Lord alone, who followed him as Savior, as Messiah, as hope alone. The reality is is that there will be many, there, there are many, right now, this very day, who heard Jesus in person and followed him and ate bread, miracle bread that he multiplied. They heard him teach, they saw him heal. They followed him around. But they didn't trust him as Lord and Savior, as Messiah. And they perished in their sins. In Matthew, the parallel passage, it says this, enter by the narrow gate, Jesus says, for the gate is wide and the way easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so we have this contrast, don't we? We have the narrow gate and the hard way, and over on this side we have the wide gate and the easy way. The way of the world. That's easy, friends. That's easy. Just conform. Just go with the crowd. Think of the Boston Marathon. You're ready to run, the alarm goes off, they don't shoot the gun anymore, I don't imagine. The alarm goes off, everyone starts going this way. That's that's not hard, you just go with the flow. That's the wide gate, that's what sinners do by instinct, right? What Jesus is saying is, strive, strive, work to enter through the narrow gate. It's the hard way. Why is it hard? Well, it's because I have to turn and face the masses of humanity that are running the opposite direction, and I seek to follow him, to trust in him, to rely upon him, and I'm working like this, and I'm getting hit, and I'm running, and I'm trying my best, and I'm ducking down the narrow gate. Hmm. 
the hard way. The word strive is agonizomai. You see the word agony in there? It's agonizing. But why? Why is it agonizing? Because, friends, we stand out. We're different. We get ostracized. We get pointed out, singled out. You have to, you have, to have a willingness to fear God over the fear of man. What do you mean, Jesus is the only way to the Father? What makes you think, are you that arrogant? Are you gonna tell me that every other world religion is wrong and you're right? I'm gonna tell you that I'm trusting the word of God and that's what it says. Yeah, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through the narrow gate. There's only one way. And that's not popular, friends. It never has been. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Agonize. Fear God. Don't allow the, the, the conforming pressures of the world to push you back. Strive. Swim upstream. And trust Jesus Christ. Treasure him. Agonize to treasure him. Bow before him. You see this narrow gate, it's not just skinny. It's narrow and, and small. It's, there's a humbling work. You have to bend down. You have to bow. Repentance and faith require humility and acknowledgement of my sin. I am not enough. I am a sinner. I need forgiveness. I find hope and forgiveness in Jesus alone. Agonize to trust him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Work hard not to earn salvation, but to delight in the gift he's given and obey him as king, as Lord, as master. Hmm. The reality is, is that there will be a day in which that narrow door is closed. And Jesus here again is warning. He's warning us. Listen to what he says. He, he leaves off and he says, I tell you, many will seek to enter and will not be able. In verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, he will answer to you. This is Jesus saying, I did not know where you come from. I, I don't know where you come from. Then you will say, Jesus, we, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Wow. There is a place in preaching for threat and warning. For threat and warning. I believe that because I see it in Jesus' preaching. He was the preacher of all preachers. We should be warned clearly and decisively this morning. Don't play games with the narrow door. Don't dance around the narrow door and say, oh, it's, it's too short and ah, I don't feel like getting down that low and you know, it's open and I'll be fine. I'll just kind of conform for a while. I don't need to enter yet, do I? Give me a few years. Let me have my fun. There is a thing that I dread. I would call it cultural Christianity. It's dangerously possible to attend church and be very comfortable. To come Sunday after Sunday, even to Good Shepherd and sit here and, and nod at the preaching. To, to be a normal part of this church, to, to, to come, to stand and sing, to sit and nod and go home and not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you have any sense that your soul is in that place, be warned today. 
be warned. We're not playing games here. That door, it's open, but it's gonna close. And don't miss this, it says many. There will be many, not just a handful, but many who come and say, oh, Jesus, I sat in a church that was preaching the gospel almost every Sunday, and he will say, I don't know you. That's not, that's not meaning I don't know about you. He's not, he's not doubting omniscience of his sovereign uh, lordship over all. He's saying, I don't know you. I don't have your heart. You didn't bow to me. You didn't trust me as Lord and Savior. I am not your king. Hmm. And then he adds this, and this is also a, a warning here. Workers of evil. It's very possible, dangerously so, to wear the label Christian and care nothing for holiness and obedience to the Lord. To coddle sin, to make much of worldliness, to be comfortable in this world where I wear this label Christian and I listen to the Christian radio station and I, I go to this church, but I am basically no different from the world when it comes to sin and righteousness. Be warned. That is not saving faith. That is not salvation. It doesn't look like that. Saving faith says to sin, I hate you. I don't want you in my life. I love righteousness and I will strive, strive for the holiness. I have been set free from sin. Why would I continue to be chained up by it? I don't want sin. I want to be holy. Oh Lord, help me to be holy. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. And when I see sin, what do I do? I call it what it is. And I kill it in the power of the gospel. It's the breathing, the air of the gospel that kills sin. We hate that sin. We don't want that darkness. We want light and righteousness. So the expression of true saving faith is going to show itself in a number of things. One, it's going to say, of Jesus, you are everything to me. You are every, you're my hope alone in this life and the next. You are my treasure, my joy, my crown, my future, my reward, my master. Lead on. Direct my steps. My days are yours, right? It's also gonna say, Lord, we got work to do, right? But there's work to be done. This sin in my life, as you reveal it, we're gonna go after it together. Now I don't have to fear the fires of hell. Once I am through that door, I'm set free to go to war on my sin, right? I got work to do with him as Lord and Savior. Hmm. Jesus builds out this warning. He says, listen, for those who knock and Jesus says, I don't know you, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, for those like Rob Bell and others who deny the reality of hell, they deny the Bible. They're denying reality, friends. God is just, he is infinitely so. Sinners are worthy of infinite, unending punishment, and there is a place where that will take place, and that is hell. And it's happening today, as I speak. It is a place that you do not want to go. He says, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all these Old Testament saints who, who trusted in faith in Christ, right? In Jesus, all of their sacrifices were anticipating his coming, his work. Saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone, just as we are, as we celebrate his finished work. When they're there and the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are cast out, that's a horrible scenario. All people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God and behold, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. I think talking about Jew and Gentile realities, the Jews thought they were first in line. It turns out 
They, in large part, will be last in line, but they will be brought in by God's unbreakable covenant promise. How will they be brought in? Through faith in Jesus Christ alone, through the narrow door. And so we have to feel the weight of warning. Friends, too many churches are preaching this gospel that is too wimpy. It's just, hey, ask Jesus into your heart and it's all good. No, that's not what Jesus is preaching here. Jesus is saying the door is narrow and the way is hard. Take up your cross. Trust in me. Go against the flow. Jesus is not just your homeboy. He has to be everything. Savior, Lord, treasure. Hmm. And the consequences are eternal. There will be a day when the narrow door closes. Now he laments over Jerusalem. These final verses, I just want to hit these because he's talking about these prophets of old and then he, he just moves right into this lament over Jerusalem. At that very hour, Verse 31, Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox. I love that. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Wow, what a stinging line that was. Well, I certainly don't expect Herod to kill me out in some podunk village because no prophet deserves the privilege of of dying anywhere but Jerusalem. What an amazing judgment that is. And then he continues. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until, the, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hmm. These are very, very sharp words from Jesus. Very direct. Very hard words to hear in that moment when he spoke those. They speak of his unwavering resolve. Herod wants to kill you? Yeah, get in line, right? Get in line. I have a course, I will run the race, and I will finish it, and no one is going to keep that from happening. He is unrelenting in his resolve to go to Jerusalem. And I just have to add here, he's speaking of the prophets being killed. Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. The perfect prophet, priest, and king. His prophetic prediction here that he will not enter into the city until Hosanna is cried, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's exactly what they did as he rode into the city. They laid down their garments and they waved palm branches and they shouted Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then, just a few days later, they shouted crucify him, crucify him. And his work was finished. What a savior we have, friends. What a savior. So these words meet us in a variety of ways. There's so many points of application. I just want to draw a few here. One is big things come in small packages. Jesus shattered the expectations of those who were waiting for the Messiah. In fact, you still, to this day, go to Israel and you meet people constantly over there. Oh no, the Messiah was not Jesus. That was not, that was not the Messiah. Our king who is going to come is going to reign. He's gonna take over politically. And you're just like, oh, you missed it. It's the mustard seed planted in the ground that springs forth in life and grows to the ends of the earth. Big things come in small packages, friends. 
This Christmas, every time you see a present, think of Jesus. Think of Jesus. He is the greatest gift you could ever receive. And he's been given. Here, just to be clear, today, today, the narrow door is open. I can promise you this. Today, that door, though it's narrow, and it requires humility and acknowledgement of your sin, repentance and trust in Jesus alone, it's open today. And you can be saved from your sins. You can be given life and forgiveness. You can have fellowship with God. Enter today through the narrow door. Because though it's open today, there is coming a day and you don't know when, when that door will close. Who knows when that door might close? You could die tomorrow. The Lord could return any moment. Think of this. There will be many who say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, Door's closed. I hope you feel this today. Don't play games with the narrow door. Trust Jesus as Savior and Lord today. Acknowledge your sin. Run to him. Cling to him. Save me, Jesus. Save me. I put my hope in you. In you alone. Show me how to live. Walk with me on the, the hard path of obedience. And though it's hard, I will say this. It's the most satisfying life you could ever live. Hmm. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we give thanks and praise to you for the gift of an open door today. And as I speak these words, they go out to all and to all who listen to this sermon someday. So long as that door is open, the message goes to the ends of the earth. Come, sinners, Come and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Come and bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Come acknowledge your sin. Repent, turn from your sin to Jesus Christ. Stop conforming to the way of the world and start to swim upstream with him. Oh, Lord, I pray that that call would, would land in hearts in this room, even now, through the power of your Spirit. Bring those who don't know you personally as Savior and Lord, bring them through that narrow door, even now, I pray. Bring life and freedom and forgiveness and joy in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the love that you show us in this. We don't deserve this gift. We thank you for an open door. And Father, I pray that on the day that that door closes, that we would be ready, that we would all be ready and celebrate the life that we have in you. Oh Lord, count us among the few, we pray. Count us among the few that, that toiled and labored to trust and rest in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.